Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. We have been working our way through the book of Exodus and tonight we are headed for Exodus chapter 40. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Exodus chapter 40. As always, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about together as a congregation, let us know. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also call or send a text to 608-224-0274. Tonight we finally come to the end of the book of Exodus, and I looked up in my notes earlier today. We started this book back on May 31st, 2023, and so we have been in Exodus for nearly Nearly a year and that makes sense because we've been looking basically at one chapter a week we've got 40 chapters in the book and we've taken several weeks off during our study and here we are at the very end of it so as we look back over the book of Exodus by way of review we obviously started back in Exodus chapter 1 with God's people in Egypt and we had been studying Genesis before that so we're kind of moving on through but they had been in Egypt for roughly 400 years first heading there in the closing chapters of Genesis due to the famine Joseph had saved the nation and surrounding nations had come to Egypt for food, including Joseph's brothers. But now Joseph is long gone. And we find in the opening verses of Exodus that a new Pharaoh comes on the scene who really doesn't appreciate what Joseph had done so many years earlier. And so Joseph's descendants are then enslaved. They are forced to make bricks. And it is brutal, and this new pharaoh is terrified, though, that the people may rebel because of this. There are many, many Israelites, and so he makes their lives more and more miserable. They cry out to God for help. God eventually sends Moses, and we have the burning bush, and we have Moses really doing everything he can to get out of that. We had two chapters dedicated to the excuses that Moses gave to the Lord for not doing what God wanted him to do. But finally, God breaks through. Moses uh, fulfills what he is is supposed to be doing and in the middle of the book then we have Moses approaching Pharaoh confronting Pharaoh would be more like it and we've got the ten plagues Pharaoh allows them to leave but then of course Pharaoh changes his mind doesn't he and he chases them into the Red Sea where the people cross over on dry ground and Pharaoh's army is drowned in the sea so the people then continue on from there they head to Mount Sinai where God gives them a series of commandments through his prophet Moses. And the rest of the book is basically Moses coordinating the construction of a tabernacle, this tent that would be used for worship out there in the wilderness as they traveled. So let's jump right into the very last chapter tonight. And let's look at the first paragraph in Exodus chapter 40. This is Exodus 40, and we're starting tonight with verses 1 through 8. Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall place the ark of the testimony there, and you shall screen the ark with the veil. You shall bring in the table and arrange what belongs on it, and you shall bring in the lampstand and mount its lamps. Moreover, you shall set the gold altar of incense before the ark of the testimony and set up the veil for the doorway to the tabernacle. You shall set the altar of burnt offering in front of the doorway of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall set the laver between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. You shall set up the court all around and hang up the veil for the gateway of the court. Here at the end of Exodus, then, we have God giving Moses the go-ahead to go ahead and set up the tabernacle. They have all the pieces put together. They've been building everything. And God now gives the command that it is time. It's time to put it all together. God gives some last-minute instruction here. He tells Moses to put everything where it goes. And what we have here at the beginning is everything on the inside of the tabernacle in verses 2, 3, 4, and 5. The tent itself, the ark, the curtain, the table, the lampstand, the altar of incense, and the veil. And then in verses 6 and 7, we have the laver and the altar located outside the tent itself along with the curtains along that outer perimeter. So let's continue on then with Exodus 40, verses 9 through 16. Exodus 40, verses 9 through 16. Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it, and shall consecrate it and all its furnishings, and it shall be holy. You shall anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, and consecrate the altar, and the altar shall be most holy. You shall anoint the laver and its stand, and consecrate it. 
Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. You shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister as a priest to me. You shall bring his sons and put tunics on them and you shall anoint them even as you have anointed their father that they may minister as priests to me. And their anointing will qualify them for a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. Thus Moses did, according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so he did. Well, now that everything is coming together, we now come to where God finally tells them how to use the anointing oil that they had made to consecrate the tent and everything in and around it. And I know as we studied over the past year or so, we know that to consecrate something is to make it holy. And to be holy is to be set apart for some special purpose. And so these items in and around the tabernacle, therefore, are now to be considered holy after they've been anointed. You couldn't take the utensils from the altar, for example, and take them home for a family dinner. That was not allowed because those utensils were holy. They were set apart. They were only to be used in God's worship. And by the way, we should note yet again, as I think we have over the past year or so, that under the new covenant, we as God's people are holy, but the building in which we worship is not holy. And so if I want to use a fork from our church facility to uh, eat my lunch while I'm there during the week, that is completely fine. I'm not offending God by doing that. That is not a holy fork. If we want to come together for a fellowship dinner after worship, also fine. If a member wants to borrow our facility for a baby shower or some other get-together, that's also fine from a spiritual point of view. I remember a few years ago somebody wanted to borrow the lawnmower. <laughs> Uh, their lawnmower had broken all of a sudden, their yard was getting deep, and they called and said, hey, can we borrow the lawnmower? It was one of our members. And you know, that lawnmower was not holy. It wasn't set apart from some spe for some special reason. It was purchased for use at that facility, but certainly the mower itself uh, was uh, nothing close to being sanctified or holy. All right, in the New Covenant, we know in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9, Paul says that we, as God's people, are God's fellow workers. And then he says, you are God's field, God's building. So we learn from that passage that we are God's building. And he's speaking of us in that passage. He wasn't talking about a physical building. And so just by way of reminder, this is why we do not refer to our auditorium as a sanctuary. Uh, some religious groups certainly do refer to their meeting place as a sanctuary, meaning that that room is holy or sanctified. And yet I think we need to understand that the place where we meet is not holy at all. Instead, we are to be holy. On Sunday, I told you about a week and a half ago going up to uh, Rice Lake, Wisconsin, and then purchasing property we worshipped in a pole barn, a pole shed. And I mentioned that we were surrounded by lawnmowers and snowblowers and old boxes and bags of stuff and church signs from years back. You know, that building that we were in was certainly not holy. It wasn't sanctified or set apart. It's where the church chooses to meet. But the real holiness in that building was in us. We as God's people are his holy building. Well, under the law of Moses, though, the place itself was indeed holy. And they were to make it holy by anointing it with the anointing oil. They do the same for the priests themselves. Everything associated with that tabernacle is to be sanctified with that anointing oil. It is to be set apart for God's service. Well, let's continue tonight with the next paragraph, Exodus 40, verses 17 through 27. Exodus 40, verses 17 through 27. Now in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle and laid its sockets and set up its boards and inserted its bars and erected its pillars. He spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent on top of it, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then he took the testimony and put it into the ark and attached the poles to the ark and put the mercy seat on top of the ark. He brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up a veil for the screen and screened off the ark of the testimony just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then he put the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil. He set the arrangement of bread and order on it before the Lord just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then he placed the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle. He lighted the lamps before the Lord just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then he placed the gold altar in the tent of meeting in front of the veil, and he burned fragrant incense on it, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. 
Well, starting in verse 17, they start getting it done. And by they, I mean Moses personally. That's the way I would take this. Maybe need to read that over a few more times, but to me, it looks like Moses does this on his own. And I'm just imagining being in that situation. You're surrounded by two to three million people. You've been working on this gold furniture. Multiple teams of men and women have come together and everybody has donated their gold and their silver and their uh, precious fabric to get this done. And Moses is given the duty of assembling it all. And to me, it seems as if he's doing this on his own. I'm imagining that all eyes are on Moses at this moment. Notice that it happens on the first day of the first month of their second year. And so if I've understood this correctly, it happens on Passover, one year after the original Passover, one year after leaving Egypt. And so they get everything put together. The ark is then brought into the tabernacle along with everything else. And it all happens just as the Lord had commanded Moses there in verse 25. And then they fire up the altar of incense. They put bread on the table and so on. Let's continue with Exodus 40, verses 28 through 33. Exodus 40, 28 through 33. Then he set up the veil for the doorway of the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering before the doorway of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered on it the burnt offering and the meal offering, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He placed the laver between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing from it. <clears throat> Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they entered the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar, they washed just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He erected the court all around the tabernacle and the altar and hung up the veil for the gateway of the court. Thus Moses finished the work. So now on the outside of the tabernacle, they hang the curtain, the doorway. Uh, they also set up the altar and the laver. They offer the first sacrifice, a burnt offering and a meal offering. And notice the priests are able to wash themselves in the labor. So everything has now been assembled and the tabernacle is fully functional. I just wanted to point out something else before we move on here. Did you notice how Moses was instructed to wash the hands and the feet, I think, of Aaron and his sons in that previous passage? And I don't know about you, but to me, uh, Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, comes to mind as he knelt down and washed the feet of his apostles, certainly preparing them for a greater ministry. I don't know if that's intended. I don't think the scripture points it out as being a connection, but in my mind, that uh, that's something that's come to mind as I've been reading this again tonight. So let's close tonight with the very last paragraph in the whole book. This is Exodus chapter 40, and we'll be looking at verses 34 through 38. Exodus 40, 34 through 38. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. Well, after they offer those first sacrifices, notice the cloud of God's presence moves in, covers the entire tent. The glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle or the tent, and, and even Moses couldn't go in the, the room at that point. Have you guys ever been hit by a cloud? I think most of us have perhaps flown into a cloud, and so there is that distinction between almost night and day sometimes, and sunny skies, and then boom, all of a sudden you're in this like gray cloud. Uh, but I remember actually getting hit by a cloud as I was outside a church building preaching a gospel meeting at the Little Beaver Church of Christ uh, down near Elkhorn City in far eastern Kentucky. And that little congregation was located way up in a holler. And on the other side of that holler was Virginia. And there had been coal mines further up in that holler. And at one point, a rail car carrying fist-sized chunks of coal had turned over near their building. And anytime anybody ever needed coal for burning, they got it right there. They had a, literally a lifetime supply of coal. An entire train car had dumped right next to the church parking lot. And it was like the unlimited supply of coal. Uh, we couldn't drink the water that week in the house that we were staying. Somebody had actually dumped medical waste in one of the mine shafts up in there. But one night, right around time for worship, we were standing out in front of the church building. And a cloud actually ran into the side of that mountain. 
and I was impressed having grown up in the Chicago area I'd never seen anything like that before this wall of gray that almost seemed solid was heading right toward us and then it came across the parking lot and it hit us and it kept on going and it was suddenly dark all around us and that's what I think of when I read this passage about God's cloud filling the tabernacle it would have been very dramatic very memorable I would say especially for the children there that day in the second half of this paragraph, notice Moses explains that when the cloud would rise, that was God's way of telling them that it was time to pack it up and move along. Uh, but if the cloud stayed put, they would stay, and they wouldn't set out on the next leg of their journey until the cloud lifted. And this was the indication of God's presence, a cloud on the tabernacle by day and fire by night. And this was very visible. This was where everybody could see it. There was no mistaking God's presence. And this is amazing to me. I mean, how comforting this must have been. Here they were depending on Moses previously, but now they aren't depending on Moses. Before he had to tell them basically everything, but every single person now could be reassured of God's presence simply by looking toward the tabernacle. As we learned a few weeks ago, all of the tents were arranged around the tabernacle with uh, three tribes camping out on each of the four sides for a total of 12 tribes spreading out in all directions. And if you can imagine two to three million people, this is a huge group of people. And so the tabernacle was the center of the entire nation as they moved through the wilderness and set up every spot that they landed in. And everybody could see the fire, they could see the cloud, symbolizing God's continuing presence with his people. And this brings us to the end of the book of Exodus. We have seen God's people make their journey to freedom, as we've had on our kind of tagline, I guess we might say, on this class over the past 11 months. And God has done this. Let's not miss this. I think that's maybe the, the biggest lesson we can learn from this book. Over and over again throughout Scripture from this point forward, God will often identify himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he also identifies himself as the God who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. And I don't know how many times that's repeated in scripture, but it's several. Uh, this was a huge event in the history of God's people, and it has been just an honor to study this one chapter at a time. Uh, next week, I am hoping to continue in our study of God's people in the wilderness, if we can keep up with this direction. Uh, but I do want to speed it up quite a bit, uh, looking uh, at far more than one chapter every week. There are a number of chapters we can look at. The, the first seven chapters of Leviticus, for example, really all go together. Uh, I do not want us to get bogged down. I don't want this study to take an eternity. There are other parts of the Bible we can go back to. We have studied every verse of the Bible over the past 24 years together. Um, but over the next several months at a minimum, maybe the next year or so, I don't know, I want us to continue looking at God's people in the wilderness. And the next three books go together, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So we've got Genesis, Exodus, and then Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They're all written by Moses. And if we need to take a break here and there, we'll take a break. And if we need to take a pause or study something else for a while, we'll do that. But that's where we're headed, if the Lord wills. And hopefully we can focus more on some uh, New Testament things in our sermons uh, going forward so we don't kind of get too out of whack, too out of balance here. So uh, we don't want to be stuck in the old. It's important, um, but there are other things that we need to look at. So thank you for joining us tonight and for joining us over the past year if you've been with us again. If you have any questions, comments, concerns about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, if there's something we could do to encourage you, uh, if there's something we need to be praying about, get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274, and we would love to hear from you. As we close this uh, study of this book, let's go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, you are the God who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand. You heard the cries of your people, and you arranged for Moses to lead your people to freedom. Pharaoh, the most powerful ruler in the world at that time, was nothing to you, and you provided for your people at every turn along the way, parting the Red Sea, providing manna and water in the wilderness, and giving them laws for their own benefit to preserve them alive so that your promise to Abraham could be fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. Our Father, we're mindful of the members of the Four Lakes congregation tonight. Some are uh, facing serious loss and some health challenges, and we pray that you would be with them and give them peace and comfort and help us to encourage one another as we should. Thank you, Father, for loving us, and thank you for Jesus. We come to you in his, in his name. Amen.